welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Friday, May 10th, we are studying Daniel chapter 8, verses 1 to 27. In today's text, Daniel sees another vision. First, a ram with one horn higher than the other, then a male goat with a great horn, and then four horns, and from those one of those horns, a little one that becomes great and commits transgression that desecrates the Lord's sanctuary. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, the Reverend Dr. Christian Preuss. Pastor Preuss serves at Mount Hope Lutheran Church and School in Casper, Wyoming. Pastor Preuss, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Thank you. Glad to be here. Pastor Preuss, you're also involved with the Board of Regents for Luther Classical College. Tell us how preparations continue. Oh, things are going great. We actually uh, admitted our first eight students to the college, even though college is uh, not starting for another 65 or so weeks. Uh, but there were uh, a number of students who... Uh, wanted to apply and, and get into the college, uh, so they knew they had a spot. Uh, they're taking a year off after high school. So uh, that happened, and then uh, uh, our, our president came on, Dr. Uh, Harold Ristow, moved here from uh, Kenya. He was formerly a seminary professor up in uh, Canada, and uh, he's hitting the ground running here, here in Casper. So exciting times. Fantastic. God be praised. Now, we get to talk about Daniel chapter 8 this morning. Talk to us about Daniel, his context, what do we need to know leading up to chapter 8? Yeah, Daniel is a Hebrew, right, Jewish prophet uh, who spent almost his entire life uh, in Babylon uh, as a, a servant, advisor, wise man uh, in, in the court of the Babylonian kings, first Nebuchadnezzar, then all the way to uh Belshazzar, who's the last uh, king of the Babylonians. Um, and then after that, uh, briefly, he served as advisor and wise man uh, to uh, Cyrus, uh, the king of Persia, who takes over the Babylonian empire. Um, and Daniel Daniel uh, has uh, all sorts of uh, prophecies that are given to him uh, by God, uh, which concern um, the kingdoms of, of the world, uh, that will come after Babylon, and then finally the great kingdom of uh, God's Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is described as as the great rock, right, that crushes all other kingdoms uh, in Daniel chapter two, um, and uh, who uh, at the end of Daniel um, is the one who uh, ushers in uh, the the age of uh, peace and everlasting righteousness. Hmm. Yeah, he was the he was the son of man in the previous chapter, Daniel chapter seven. We saw the the son of man ascending before the ancient of days and being seated and given glory in this everlasting kingdom. So certainly that theme of kingdoms and who really is the king has continued throughout Daniel, and we're going to see that again in today's vision. Anything in terms of today's vision that we need to know? We get to look at a lot of history, I think, today, Pastor Price. Yeah, we're we're going to talk about a lot of history today. Um, the uh, you know part, part of the reason that we study history is that we can understand the Bible and uh, Daniel Daniel chapter eight is impossible to understand unless you uh, know a little bit about ancient history the uh, Persian Empire uh, this this Alexander the Great um, and uh, and then finally the uh, uh, the the d- kind of disintegration of the Greek kingdom um, uh, that Alexander left behind uh, and the uh, Seleucid Empire in in uh, Syria. So we'll be talking about a lot of that and uh, we'll sort it out and and make sense of this prophecy. All right. So we are reading Daniel chapter eight this morning. Here is the text. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. And I saw in the vision. And when I saw, I was in Susa, the capital, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision and I was at the Ulai Canal. I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, 
but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth, without touching the ground, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram with the two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and instead of it there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. It grew great even to the host of heaven, and some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the burnt and the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. And a host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering because of transgression, and it will throw truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes it desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, For two thousand three hundred evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. He said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the, at the latter end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia, and the goat is the king of Greece, and the great horn between his eyes is the first king. As for the horn that was broken, in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power. And he shall cause fearful destruction, and shall succeed in what he does, and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and in his own mind he shall become great. Without warning he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true, but seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. So text for today, that's Daniel chapter 8, verses 1 to 27. Pastor Price, talk to us about the context. We're in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar when Daniel has this vision. Talk to us about the context and the opening things he sees. Yeah, so the third year of King Belshazzar is around 550 uh, BC. So this is about 10 years before Babylon's going to fall to Cyrus. And it's it's significant then uh, that Daniel right now, he's he's an older man. Uh, he's probably around 70 years old at this time. Uh, he's, again, spent uh, his entire life uh, basically from, from youth in the Babylonian uh, court. And here, he's probably not at Susa. It's just that he sees a vision of Susa. Um, he's probably in Babylon itself. And so he sees himself there in Susa, uh, which is uh, east of uh, Babylon uh, and um, in what modern modern day Iran instead of Iraq, where Daniel would be. And uh, it, this is significant because Susa will end up being the capital of of Persia. In fact, around this time, Persia is taking over Susa. <laughs> right? And right. so um, 
the fact that Daniel is there uh, means that Daniel, who, right, we historically uh, see, uh, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, So we see uh, that very soon Persia is going to take over Babylon. Daniel does not know this at this time. Um, and the fact that he's there um, is uh, s- sort of unsettling for him. And that's why at the end of this, uh, end of this chapter, he's just very troubled um, because it looks like uh, Babylon might be uh, taken over here pretty soon. Uh, so that is the context. Um, Persia is rearing its ugly head. That's what's going on right now. About the time of this uh, vision, this prophecy, um, Cyrus the Great is uh, taking over, or maybe just has taken over uh, the kingdom and joined the Median and Persian kingdoms. They were two separate kingdoms. The Medeans uh, uh, had usually ruled over the Persians, and now the, the Persian Cyrus has has taken over uh, from his grandfather, Astyages, and he has now um, uh, combined these two kingdoms and made them extremely powerful. And what he's going to do is he's going to sweep north, west, and south, uh, and he's going to take over everything, um, uh, go all the way, all the way to uh, the, the, Greek, um, the, the, the Greek cities in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. Mm. So for for Daniel, then, as you said, he sees himself in Susa, and this is news to him in, in a way that, you know, he, I mean, the previous chapter, which does come chronologically before this, has revealed some of these things to him, such, and he's got Nebuchadnezzar's dream from previously, he's seen the reality that Babylon isn't the last kingdom of the world. But maybe that that reality that, you know, as you said, he spent almost his whole life here in Babylon. This is everything that he's known from a human perspective to realize that it's going to be wiped out by this uh, ram, as we'll talk about here in a moment, is is troubling to him in a way. I mean, I suppose much like uh, for us who've, who've lived in the United States of America for our whole lives and we watch the ways that, that our country is falling apart, it's very difficult for us to see that, even as we realize that the kingdom of God is supreme and reigns over all and is the kingdom that lasts, no others do. It's still difficult for us to, to watch our own uh, earthly kingdoms go to pieces. Is there something like that going on, you think? Oh, absolutely. I think that it's easy enough to, to say with our minds, well, of course, all kingdoms come to an end. Look at history. That's obviously what happens. Rome fell and so forth. Um, and then it's quite another thing to uh, see, oh, this is going to happen in, in my own lifetime um, to actually experience it. Um, and no one, I mean, I don't, I, I don't think we're expecting America to fall in our lifetime. Um, I mean, maybe I'm young enough, uh, but the uh, Daniel is is he knows this is, is supposed to happen, right? That um, the Babylonian Empire has to fall, and another yeah. empire is going to come, but then another, and so forth. Um, but to actually see it happen before his eyes, that's quite another thing. Sure, yeah. Daniel's given a, a prophetic vision that we have not been given. It's just sometimes difficult to to watch the way our kingdom is going and and realize that's not a good thing. Uh, Daniel sees something even greater than that in the destruction of Babylon at the hands of Persia. That does lead to again what we see at the end of the chapter that he's he's sick, he's appalled, he doesn't fully understand everything that's going on even as he sees it revealed. So uh, let's talk about this ram then. Daniel's in in Susa. He's on the banks of the the canal. I'm not sure if there's anything particular to explain about the canal other than it's there in Susa. And it's there where he sees this ram. So talk to us about the, the ram. Yeah, so the ram, which has these two horns, uh, very, very obviously um, the Persian Median kingdom. Like you didn't even need Gabriel to explain that if you knew uh, <laughs> history and if you'd read Daniel 7. Um, because uh, the, the two horns represent Persia and Medea. Um, so it's very regular in biblical literature. Daniel, you see it in Daniel um, 6, but you also see it in uh, secular uh, literature too, uh, that when they refer to this kingdom, the Persian kingdom, they refer to it as the Medea Persian kingdom. And they'll also say things like, uh, you know, the laws of, of, of the... Uh, 
kings of of uh, Persia and Medea. So they're, they're, they're constantly combined. And so this ram is just very obviously, everyone agrees, not not even a controversy uh, whatsoever. Uh, this this is uh, the Persian kingdom. Uh, the Persian kingdom uh, ends up uh, dominating uh, the Mediterranean um, all the way up to uh, Alexander the Great. So from this time, about 550, and especially when they take Babylon in 539, all the way to 336, when Alexander the Great um, uh, begins his campaign against them, uh, they do just don't, they are the greatest political force in the world, uh, hands down. And they're they're a much bigger empire than uh, Babylon ever was uh, or Assyria ever was, um, and uh, they clash with Greece. Um, pretty much immediately with Greek speaking lands. Um, you have you have Cyrus and then after him Cambyses and then after him Darius and then after him Xerxes. Darius in 490 actually gets so angry at the Greeks that he crosses the Aegean and uh, attempts to uh, take over Athens, uh, the, the major Greek city state. And Athens, Athens defeats him at Marathon, which is where we get the whole idea of a marathon because a guy ran from Marathon all the way to Athens, which is 26.1 miles, um, and uh, to warn uh, the, the city of Athens to close their gates uh, and uh, to, to expect Darius's fleet to come. Darius's fleet did come uh, and saw that the Athenians were already... Uh, um, on, on their guard, and so he, he sailed back. Uh, Xerxes, uh, who was the next king of Persia, did not forget this slight, and he prepared for years a campaign against the Greeks. And uh, that campaign uh, started in 480, uh, and he goes with, uh, according to Herodotus, a million-man army uh, and a thousand uh, ships, and he goes uh, and uh, bridges the Hellespont, and so he goes from Asia Minor all the way through Thrace and Macedonia down to uh, down to Greece. He sacks Athens, um, and then he gets defeated in a major uh, a naval battle at Salamis in 480, um, devastating to uh, the the Persians. And then the next year in 479, in a land uh, battle uh, in Plataea. Uh, and the Greeks, the Greek city-states, they come together and uh, defeat the greatest empire uh, that the world has ever seen. And the Persians run away, um, and yet the Greeks don't, uh, they're not powerful enough to actually be, be um, conquering the Persians. They, they, they don't even attempt to. Uh, they try to control the Aegean, but that's about it. And the Persians, for another hundred some years, are this huge elephant in the room, and Greece is constantly afraid of them. Um, but that tells you how much the Greeks hated the Persians, um, because the Persians had had invaded their land, and so this is just in their blood. Uh, and so when Alexander the Great um, takes over, he is he he tries to fulfill. Uh, every Greek's dreams, right? And that is to utterly destroy the Persians. Uh, it was his father's dream, Philip of Macedon before him, and Al Alexander the Great is the man who actually does it. Um, and Alexander the Great sort of like taking over the world, uh, which is what happens here with the uh, with this goat. Um, this is uh, this this happens very swiftly and utterly destroys uh, in just a few years all of the Persian Empire. Mm. So with the before we move on to Alexander the Great and the the goat, the ram that Daniel sees has the two horns, both being high, one higher than the other. That thought of the one being higher than the other seems to correspond to the vision that Daniel has in chapter seven, where he sees the Median Persian Empire as this bear that was raised up on one side. So there's this sort of imbalance, you know, the bear's higher on mm -hmm. one side, you've got the horn that's higher on one side. Is that is that higher horn or that imbalance, is that because of the, the union of the Medes and the Persians? Or is there a particular king in mind that's higher than others? Any insight on, on why the one horn's higher than the other? Yeah, it's a... Um... The same meaning to those visions, the bear with the, the shoulder that's higher than the other, and then this uh, horn uh, that's higher than the other. Um, and that is that uh, the 
the Persian side uh, wins out. It's it's higher, more mighty. And so Cyrus, even though he's both Median and Persian and unites them, uh, he is uh, he, he is Persian, uh, I believe, on his father's side. And so um, even though the Persian is, is, is a, a newer kingdom, it is the kingdom that dominates in this Median uh, Persian empire. So that's, that's what's going on there. All right, so you've got this ram, the two horns, and as Daniel sees it, it is a very powerful animal. As you said, westward, northward, southward, it charges in these directions. No one stands before this ram. No one rescues for this power. He does as he pleases. It becomes great. And as you mentioned, we're talking a reign of over 200 years where Persia is the world's superpower until Alexander the Great. And as we correspond here to Daniel's vision, and beginning in verse 5, he sees this male goat comes from the west and goes across the face of the whole earth. It says without touching the ground, and there's this really conspicuous horn between its eyes. So talk to us about that vision and how we see that in Alexander the Great and the Greeks. Yeah, well, Alexander the Great stunned the world. Uh, the, the the swiftness with which he took it over uh, went all the way to India, annihilated uh, the, the Persian Empire, uh, and spread Greek culture everywhere uh, was was startling it's amazing so that's why he's not even hitting the ground it's just so swift like i said in three years from 336 to 333 uh he has uh three major battles with uh the the persian army i mean we're talking like a million man army of the persian army and he destroys them every time um and then after that it's it's over um there is no persian empire after that um we'll talk a little bit later that that creates a, a power vacuum um, because Alexander the Great doesn't live very long. He dies in 323, and he starts this whole campaign in 336. So it's just a 13-year uh, reign. Uh, but in that 13 years, it, <laughs> he quickly just takes over the world, including, uh, I mean, the, the known world. He doesn't go west. He doesn't go to Rome or anything, but no one cared about Rome at that time. Right. Um, he goes uh, all the way to India, though, and he um, uh, goes all the way down to Egypt. Um, he takes over the Holy Land, so he takes over Israel. Uh, he takes over uh, basically the entire world that the Bible talks about. Uh, that's that's what he takes mm -hmm. over, and, and it is that swift. The fact that he has that one horn uh, means that it's him. He's he's the one. It's not many kings, right? So uh, as opposed to you know the two horns of the ram, and that this kingdom lasts two thousand or two hundred years, and it's as, as I listed. You have Cyrus, you have Cambyses, you have Darius, you have Xerxes, you have another Darius, you have Artaxerxes, so forth and so on. Uh, not so with Alexander the Great. It's just him. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's all about uh, his ambition um, and his uh, brilliant uh, uh, generalmanship, if that's a word. Uh, he is, uh, he's the man. Uh, so that's, uh, that is the, um, uh, the depiction of him as a, as a goat with just that one horn in the center. Is there anything between the difference uh, of a ram versus a goat that's like, I mean, when I think about, you know, I got the sheep and the goats and Jesus, and, and that doesn't seem to be going on here. Is there a difference between the ram and the goat that seems significant in these depictions, or is that just the way the Lord chose to do it? Yeah, I think, um, so when I think of a ram, I think of a, a very powerful uh animal uh probably because of the sports teams right and you see those pictures of the you, you know their their big horns and so forth but um actually i mean the ram is just the male of the of the sheep um and a goat is far more aggressive and bigger um than uh than the ram so that that's what's going on here is that the goat is just a more powerful animal and and again we kind of have to check ourselves there because when we think of a ram we think of uh, a more powerful animal uh but this is a ram goat that's going, and the, the ram goat, uh, the male goat, is, is simply a more powerful. Think of uh, the, the billy goat gruff. <laughs> that's exactly right? what I was thinking of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Alexander the Great here, uh, and he's more powerful than the ram. That's right. Okay, so he, he has this single horn. It's just him. And whereas the ram you know, has this great power, no one can rescue from the power. And historically, we know that that lasts for a long time. Alexander comes and goes very quickly, which we see toward the end of uh, this part of the vision about the goat. In verse 8, it says, The goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Got about two minutes here before the break, Pastor Preuss. Uh, get us started then with what happens in the death of Alexander and how the that starts to split up. Okay, so first, Alexander... 
uh, spreads Greek culture everywhere. So it's only 13 years, but he, he, he founds uh, dozens of cities, uh, names a lot of them Alexandria, um, and he spreads Greek culture, uh, the gymnasium, um, uh, and Greek language everywhere. And that sticks. But what does not stick is one, um, one kingdom. So when he dies, uh, everything is in disarray. There's this power vacuum, and four of his generals take over, um, and that's the, that's the four uh, four horns, and they they, they divide up um, his kingdom into four parts. So you have Cassander who takes over Greece and Macedon. You have Lysimachus who takes over Thrace and Asia Minor. Uh, those two are not very important for our purposes. And then you have Seleucus or Seleucus who uh, takes over Syria. And that is very important. And Ptolemy, who takes over uh, Egypt. And it's Seleucus and Ptolemy, these kingdoms, the Ptolemaic kingdom in Egypt and the Seleucid kingdom in Syria, that are what's sandwiched between them? Israel. And they're constantly going to be fighting over uh, control of Palestine, of the Holy Land. And so, um, uh, and, and both of them are Greek, right? So those sort of, the, and Greeks are pagans. Um, and that influence is going to uh, affect uh, also the uh, the people of God in Israel uh, and cause all sorts of problems, as we'll see as we'll see soon. That's right. Okay. So with that in mind, we've got the four generals who succeed Alexander. The two in particular that we need to pay attention to are the ones in Egypt and the ones in Syria, because the Holy Land is sandwiched in between, and that's going to set up what happens in the rest of Daniel's vision, which we will pick up on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor Christian Preuss this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that an investment with Lutheran Church Extension Fund exclusively supports LCMS ministries and church workers? That's right. LCEF ensures LCMS churches, schools, and organizations have access to the financial resources they need to sustain, strengthen, and start ministry work. In other words, you can feel good investing with LCEF because we share your Lutheran values and love for the church. Learn more at lcef.org. LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Friday, May 10th. We're studying Daniel chapter 8, verses 1 to 27 with the Reverend Dr. Christian Price. He serves at Mount Hope Lutheran Church and School in Casper, Wyoming. Pastor Price, before we go on to what happens with this little horn that comes out of the, one of the four horns, you made a, a comment about Alexander the Great and the way that he spreads Greek culture everywhere. And while that's not perhaps as important for this particular vision, that is important when we think about the the scope of history and the the biblical narrative. Why why is that an important reality that Alexander spreads that Greek Greek culture? Just thinking about the whole scope of history and the the scope of God's story of salvation. Yeah. So the the, the main thing is that this is called Hellenization. So um, uh, uh, Hellas is just the, the the Greek name for Greece. So Hellenization of 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 the Mediterranean of the world. Uh, is that you end up having uh, a one language that uh, everyone can speak um, and um, uh, a way for them to actually talk to one another. Um, when you have language barriers and culture barriers, it makes it extremely uh, difficult to communicate. And so that uh, that's Alexander's legacy is that he, he spreads Greek culture and Greek uh, language so that like our New Testament is written in Greek. Um, and if you have... You know, if you read John chapter 19 and you see uh, the, the Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, the placard that's put above our Savior's head as he's crucified, it's written in Greek, right, and in Hebrew and in Latin. 
Well, it's written in Hebrew or Aramaic so that the Jews can read it, in Latin so that the Romans can read it, in Greek so that everyone can read it. <laughs> That's the point. It is the, it is the universal language and stays the universal language so that even uh, when Rome, the Romans take over, they're still speaking Greek. The educated are still speaking Greek. Uh, the emperors are speaking Greek. Um, and it, become, it, it, it stays the universal language uh, for hundreds of years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And again, and that is, I think, uh, again, maybe not a side point from this text, but it is important as we think about what this text is up to, thinking about how, for example, as Paul says in Galatians 4, that the Lord sent his son in the fullness of time. What we're seeing here is the Lord working that out, the fullness of time, not an aimless sort of wandering through history, but the Lord directing history all for the, his own purposes of bringing the Savior into the world and accomplishing the salvation of mankind. So these things, while you may be scratching your heads, like, well, why do I need to know about the four generals who who took over after Alexander died? That's that's why this is important to us as Christians, because we are seeing how the Lord is working in history for his purposes. That's what he's revealing here to Daniel. Now, as he continues then in his vision, We've got these four horns that arose after Alexander died, and we're going to focus in on one of them. Out of one of them comes a little horn. And you said, Pastor Preuss, that the, especially the two, the two empires we need to pay attention to after Alexander are the Ptolemies in Egypt and the Seleucids in Syria. So we've got this little horn that comes out of one of them. Keep going forward in the historical account. Yeah, so the, the, the little horn that comes out of the one... It's coming out of the Seleucid horn. Uh, so again, this is the this, the Syrian Empire here um, that uh, the general Seleucus uh, started, and um, the 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 man um, who is represented by this little horn uh, is named Antiochus uh, Epiphanes. Uh, he named himself Epiphanes. That means the manifest. He actually uh, so he he starts reigning around 175. Uh, uh, eight, uh, BC, sorry, 175 uh, BC, and uh, he warred against uh, the Ptolemies, uh, fought and defeated uh, the Ptolemaic king. Uh, he's very powerful. He mints coins where he puts his name and then uh, Theos Epiphanes, which means God manifest. So the guy is claiming to be a god in typical Eastern fashion, uh, very arrogant um, and um, extremely powerful. Um, so when it says in our text that it became great, even as great as the prince of the host, uh, this is saying that uh, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes is exalting himself as God and is opposing God himself. Um, what Antiochus Epiphanes does uh, is that he ends up persecuting in particular uh, Jerusalem. And this is where the Greek culture actually is really important uh, because um, we are not unaffected by our own culture all around us, right? We can pretend that we are, but we aren't. Um, the way the culture goes, uh, our, our minds get shaped that way. And the, and, and the Jews of this time who are supposed to, you know, the temple has been reestablished in, in, in Jerusalem. The morning and evening sacrifices, which point to Jesus, uh, have been uh, reinstituted. They're circumcising their boys and so forth. They're reading the Torah. They're reading the law. This is all happening uh, as they're uh, uh, waiting for the Messiah to come. And Antiochus Epiphanes comes in and says, no, you guys got to be Greeks now. And that means you're not worshiping this backward Yahweh Lord God, and you're not doing these uh, sacrifices, you're not reading your Moses, your Torah, and you're not looking forward to some other Messiah. I am Theos Epiphanes. I am God manifest. And he goes in there, and in 169 BC, um, he uh, sacks the temple. He takes away their uh, their altar, all of their um, all of their uh, utensils, um, and so that, and, and including the curtain of the temple, <laughs> and he uh, so he 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 just desecrates the the the, the most holy place, and. Uh, he sets up uh, a, an idol uh, in there also. Mm -hmm. He comes back in 167 BC, um, and he uh, makes all sorts of laws against um, uh, Jewish religion, uh, so Christian religion at this time. Um, he 
says he takes away the morning and evening sacrifices in 167 BC. So he says, you may no longer do this. And he actually uh, puts a garrison in uh, Jerusalem uh, in their, uh, on Mount Zion. So a garrison meaning he's got soldiers there uh, and they're controlling this city. And they control the city uh, for uh, a good three years. Um, if you want to read more about uh, Antiochus Epiphanes and what he did, you can read it in 1st Maccabees and 2nd Maccabees, but 1st Maccabees, um, uh, it really, just the, just read the first chapter of 1st Maccabees and you'll see um, the arrogance of this man, uh, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, this great Seleucid uh, emperor or king. Mm, yeah, okay, so 1st Maccabees there in the Apocrypha, this is a section in the scriptures where having a little bit of knowledge of the Apocrypha is helpful from a historical perspective. Now, okay, so Antiochus Epiphanes has done all of these terrible things in Jerusalem, desecrated the temple in a number of ways. We see that here in Daniel and in a number of places as it talks about the host and the stars, this little horn's going to throw down and trample on them. He's setting himself up against the one true God. He's taking away the offerings. But we know that that's not the end of, of the story, and that's part of the reason Daniel's receiving this vision, is to receive comfort in the face of this persecution that's to come. Uh, keep telling us the history of, of Antiochus Epiphanes. Yeah, so Antiochus um, institutes all sorts of pagan uh, sacrifices there. Uh, they're sacrificing pigs on the altar, uh, so desecrating it. Um, they're forbidding circumcision. It becomes against the law to circumcise. Uh, they're putting to death women. Uh, for circumcising their children. Uh, it's a beautiful thing um, as far as these women go uh, because and, and men. Um, they're still circumcising their sons in defiance of Antiochus Epiphanes um, and uh, being slaughtered for it. And it's a lot like us if people were to say, hey, you can't baptize your kids. Well, we're going to do it anyway um, because uh, we're going not only going to obey our Lord, but we're going to receive his promises. And uh, the eternal life of our children is far more important that, than, uh, than their temporal life. Uh, and so you have these heroes, these these uh, Christian Jewish heroes here uh, in the time of the Maccabees. Um, the Torah itself is outlawed. If you have a book that is, if you have the book of most, if you have the book of the Old Testament, it is outlawed. Uh, and if you're caught with it, you're put to death uh, during uh, um, Antiochus's reign of terror here. Uh, so he is very, very evil. Um, and you the uh, tearing down of the stars. The stars uh, represent the saints of God. Uh, and so this is uh, him not only overthrowing the worship in the temple, but also uh, murdering and slaughtering uh, God's faithful people. Uh, and then when it says that he uh, uh, you know, tramples over the truth, uh, that's specifically talking about banning the, the word of God, banning the Old Testament. Um, now, what ends up happening is that Judas Maccabeus, uh, that's why it's called uh, First Maccabees, this book of the, uh, of the Apocrypha, which in like your Roman Catholic tradition is actually part of your Bible um, and would have been included actually in our Bible, in the Lutheran Bibles, uh, um, just put at the back of the book <laughs> until, right. until rather recently. It's not Bible. It's not, it's not inspired by God, but very, very helpful literature. Um, but it's named after uh, the Maccabees. And uh, I, I spoke before about how Antiochus Epiphanes put uh, a garrison there in the temple or uh, um, uh, on Mount Zion uh, in Jerusalem to control Jerusalem. And what uh, Judas Maccabeus does uh, is he leads a revolt and he overthrows uh, this uh, violent king and his army and uh, expels them from Jerusalem. Um, and uh, restores the, the worship of that temple. When we talk about these 2,300 evenings and mornings, in the Hebrew it actually says evening, morning, 2,300. Um, and what that means is that uh, for about 1,150 days, which is a little over three years, the evening and morning sacrifices, remember that every single day in that temple, there were evening and morning sacrifices to represent the um, uh, the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus, so that it always happened, and, pe and, and people were looking forward to the Messiah giving his life. That was interrupted for three years. Um, and so these 2,300 evenings and mornings is 1,150 days, um, and Judas uh, Maccabeus, he, uh, he reinstates uh, these, uh, the, the sacrifices of the temple. Uh, the cleansing of the temple 
uh, the restoration of the temple uh, is known to us as Hanukkah. Uh, and that's what that's what Hanukkah means is uh, restoration of the temple. And so uh, actually we could celebrate Hanukkah as Christians um, because this was a great Christian event that we uh, that that they re reinstituted the sacrifices in the temple, which pointed to our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, that also shows you, too, this is the big issue uh, of Antiochus Epiphanes. It's not just that he he. Um, you know, persecuted uh, these these innocent people. That he's a you know big bad baddie guy, right? Who's an evil tyrant. It is that he uh, interrupted the worship of that temple, mm -hmm. and that is what Daniel uh, uh, focuses on. And uh, we as Christians should pay particular attention to that uh, because uh, these 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 sacrifices pointed ahead to Christ. And so Antiochus Epiphanes, he doesn't care about God. He doesn't. He doesn't. He thinks he. He is a God. He doesn't care about Jesus or anything. But the particular harm that he causes is not just death and carnage and 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 taking away their freedom as Jewish, uh, you know, as a Jewish state or Jewish people. It's not political. Uh, that's not the great threat that he is. His great threat is against the worship of God, and in particular, those sacrifices that point ahead to Jesus Christ, uh, our, our our Savior, who, who offers Himself as the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Mm, to the to the festival of Hanukkah, the rededication of the temple, it's probably worth also noting that our Lord celebrates this in John chapter 10. We have mention of the Feast of Dedication there. That's what he's celebrating. And this, this text from Daniel chapter 8, although it doesn't specify all the things that happened there that you could, re again, read more about in the Apocrypha, this is some of the biblical background for what Jesus is doing there in John chapter 10, celebrating that Feast of Dedication. Uh, before we let's let's just keep moving through the the history. Then we'll probably pick up a few more things when it comes to An Antiochus Epiphanes, as the as the vision ends there in verse fourteen. Daniel is going to get the interpretation, and there's a little more in terms of the interpretation as to what happens to the end uh, of Antiochus Epiphanes in verse oh, 25. It's, we've got, without warning, he shall destroy many. He shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. So we have the, you know, Antiochus Epiphanes is going to do all these evil, blasphemous, wicked things, but he will not, he will not prosper. He will not, he will not be the victor. It talks about him being broken by no human hand. But just take us through the history of the end of Antiochus Epiphanes. Yeah, well, Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, when it says that he was, uh, you know, broken by no human hand, that obviously means that he's broken by God. Um, so um, in materialistic uh, language, it means he died uh, of natural causes, right? So he wasn't assassinated uh, or anything like, or murdered or anything like that. Um, but he did die uh, suddenly, and it was a God thing. Uh, you, you can look at sort of like the analogy of uh, Herod, uh, in the book of Acts, uh, who um, is when he gives uh, this speech to the people of Tyre and they start shouting, uh, the voice of a God and not a man, the voice of a God and not a man, and he takes it, he's, and he's, he's, he's glorying in, in, in their accolades, and God strikes him down and he dies of worms um, that are eating his bowels. And that something very similar happens to Antiochus Epiphanes. He's struck with some uh, disease, uh, probably some intestinal disease, uh, and he, uh, he dies suddenly. And it actually does uh, humble him. Uh, he starts making uh, overtures uh, to Jerusalem saying, oh yeah, you guys can keep on worshiping your God now. Um, and it really does show uh, that God's uh, that God's in charge. The mightiest uh, of these kings and and emperors, uh, God humbles them. Um, Alexander the Great's another example of that, uh, where yeah. you know he's great, he's the mightiest man ever, and yet uh, uh, God strikes him down at age like what 30, 33, 35. Um, so I've already lived longer than Alexander the Great, which is a great accomplishment. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Both in both of those those the way that their reigns end, you see that same reality 
that as powerful as they were, as wicked as, as especially Antiochus Epiphanes was, and it's not like, I mean, we already talked about the, the Greek culture that Alexander spread, which certainly included paganism. I mean, as, as wicked as both of these men are, and as powerful as they seem, they are brought to an end suddenly because they are not the true king. The Lord alone is the true king, which is it, probably a big reason why the Lord gives this vision to Daniel, although at the time he's distressed, it ultimately is is meant for the comfort of God's people as they go through these things. I think you maybe see some of that in the fact that Daniel is, is told to seal up this vision right now because it refers to days from now. Uh, talk to us about the, the comfort that the Lord intends by revealing some of these things to his people. Yeah, so it's a comfort to know that God's in charge. Um, and that he controls all these kingdoms, uh, and he will work it all for good. Uh, that's hard to see when you're in the uh, thick of it. Um, and Antiochus Epiphanes is uh, uh, focused on here in chapter 8, because he is uh, not only so uh, such a big figure in Jewish history, what's going to happen to these people, but also he's a type of things to come. He's, he's a type, he's a picture of uh, the sort of tyrant that arises and persecutes Christ and his church. Um, and so in Daniel 7, uh, we uh, it, it talked about the Antichrist who is to come, right? Who's going to oppose uh, Christ and his saints. And here is one of those Antichrists, is Antiochus uh, Epiphanes. So he's a type of it. Um, and we, we have many of these uh, in the history of the uh, Christian church. Uh, that is very powerful men who persecute Christianity and Christians. Um, and exalt themselves as gods. Um, and uh, uh, to know that in this particular case, God brought him down, right? Um, God ended his reign of terror. And uh, God, uh, through a Messiah-like figure, right, Judas Maccabeus, um, uh, brought peace to his people and the sacrifices back and true religion back uh, and true worship of God back. And God will do it again, and he has done it again over and over and over again. That's the history of the Christian church. It really, really is amazing that Christianity uh, was illegal for the first th 300 years of its existence and yet grew and grew and grew under persecution um, and uh, sometimes very heavy persecution. Um, so much so that, I mean, the estimates are that 20% of the Roman Empire, by the time of Constantine, uh, so by, by the time that Christianity becomes legal, 20% of the Roman Empire was already Christian, an illegal religion, right? Uh, so God worked through all of these, you know, horrible persecutors to preserve his church. And it really um, uh, confirms the words of our Lord Jesus, that the gates of hell will not prevail against uh, against his church. Absolutely. Talk a little bit more about, with Antiochus Epiphanes being uh, one of these antichrists, you made the point that the real problem with Antiochus Epiphanes is the way that he disrupts the worship life of the church of that day, those sacrifices that were intended to point forward to the once-for-all sacrifice in our Lord Jesus Christ that he has made now for us. Talk a little bit more about that, the importance of seeing that in, in the Antichrist as we see others throughout history that have you know, done these things. I think sometimes there's a temptation, and, and I'm not sure if it's just a modern one, but it, it does seem that we kind of fixate more on the political aspect of these of these figures and the, their power in a worldly sense. Talk more about the importance of it. It's, it's really that, you know, that disruption of the worship life of the church when we need to, uh, in terms of recognizing this in, in, our, in our world today. Yeah, you're right. That, that that's a a great point, and we do. We're we're political creatures, as Aristotle said, right? We're political animals, and so we always want to turn things uh, political because that's what we're concerned about. We like to wake up in the morning and you know check the news instead of reading our Bible. Um, and uh, the the fact is that the Antichrist is both a political and a theological reality. So they're they're usually joined, um, but it is the uh, the disruption of the worship of um, the Christian Church. Uh, that is uh, particularly offensive to God and that really makes the Antichrist anti-Christ. Um, and so when the Roman Pope did so, you know, uh, forbade, forbade the gospel, um, turned the uh, Lord's Supper instead of a, a, a feast of forgiveness 
uh, for the people where they received their Lord's body and blood uh, for the forgiveness of their sins. Instead, turned it into a, a sacrifice uh, for the sins of the living and the dead, um, uh, especially those in purgatory, uh, and turned it into a money-making machine and so forth. Uh, when he taught that you were saved uh, by your own works and not by faith in the, the once and for all sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the Lutherans... Um, uh, identified him correctly uh, as as antichrist um, and uh, back in the 16th century of course that was again not just a spiritual reality but a political reality because the pope had armies and had political power and he used that political power uh, uh, in order to disrupt the worship of 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 the christian church um, and so also today, any power um, that we might uh, point out that is, you know, anti-Christian, uh, it's not, it can't just be a political one that, oh, they're raising our taxes, right? <laughs> or we're losing our, our you know, our, our freedom or, or whatever, right? Just as it wasn't about Jewish identity uh, in, um, in the time of the Maccabees, in the time of Antiochus, uh, Epiphanies, but rather it was about those sacrifices that pointed to Jesus. So now it is about the preservation of the gospel. So if we want to point to an antichrist today, it must be one that's actually uh, trying to forbid Christians uh, from worshiping or trying to disrupt our, our worship of the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, and in particular, um, hearing his gospel, confessing his gospel, receiving the Lord's Supper, uh, having the divine service uh, among us. Uh, where Christ reigns as king. Mm, yeah, and that is a very important realization for us as, as Christians, because the the deceit, I mean, you think about some of the things that Daniel says, or that is revealed to Daniel here, verse 25, by his cunning he shall make deceit prosper under his hand. These these lies that are told are, are very deceitful, they're very tempting, and, and we need to be steeled and ready with the truth so that we would recognize those lies and not fall prey to them. I mean, you you highlighted some of the faithfulness of God's people during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, but I also have no doubt, just knowing history, that there are also those that were led astray. And, and we should take courage from the example of those who were faithful and also be warned by the example of those who were, who were unfaithful, because surely there were both. And we do well to, to recognize that so that we can continue faithful in the, in the Lord and his word today. Yeah, that that uh, actually is recorded in, in in First Maccabees again. If you read that first chapter, um, so I'm giving the the hearers uh, some homework um, that people were unfaithful. Um, they actually tried to reverse their circumcisions, stop circumcising their kids. Uh, again, uh, they exercised naked back then. Gymnos in Greek uh, is where you get the word gymnasium. So that's where they exercised, and they exercised gymnos, naked. Um, and so you could see if people were circumcised or not. And they they uh, reversed or tried to <laughs> uh, uh, reverse their circumcision, stop circumcising their boys and so forth in order to live like the Greeks, in order to live like the people around them. Uh, so it's uh, uh, the scandal uh, is also that it led Christians astray from the true uh, word of God. Um, and the, the very sad thing about that is that they did this. And what, what happens in the end? Well, God always wins, right? Yeah. So in the time, it might look like compromise is the right thing to do and just go along with the culture. But in the end, you're going to stand before God. <laughs> right and he is the he is the ruler of all these kingdoms they've all fallen right and he's the one who remains look at how many kingdoms have fallen risen and fallen in the last 2000 years uh since Christ uh, sent out his apostles and yet what has remained true what has remained consistent uh, what institution is there in the entire world where we teach and do exactly the same thing that we have for 2,000 years. It is only the Christian church, uh, and uh, the gates of hell have not prevailed against it. And so we stay faithful uh, to him and uh, uh, take warning, like you said, uh, not to be like the unfaithful um, and uh, also follow the great example of those uh, who were willing even uh, to die under Antiochus um, uh, rather than uh, deny their Lord. Mm, yeah, God be praised for his faithfulness in establishing his eternal kingdom 
in our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Reverend Dr. Christian Preuss serves at Mount Hope Lutheran Church and School in Casper, Wyoming. He's been helping us today to study Daniel chapter 8, verses 1 to 27. Pastor Preuss, thanks for being our guest today. Great to be with you. Thank you. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about Daniel 8, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a joy to hear from you. Next week, we will pick up Daniel chapter 9. Hear Daniel pray to the Lord and receive and answer more visions to consider as the Lord continues to comfort Daniel in the reality of his eternal kingdom. Thanks for spending the morning with us today. Talk to you again next week. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.